，飞升主任，还有呃在座的呃各位贵宾、各位老师、各位同学们，大家午安，大家好。很高兴呢，呃，我们有这个机会呢，可以邀请到 Stanford University EECS 客座教授，同时也是 Deep Learning 大 AI 还有 Coursera 的这个共同创办人，呃 ，Professor Andrew Wu 呢，来跟我们分享这个 Opportunities in AI。那我在想，有一些演讲者呢，我们要花很大的精力去介绍，可是有些不用。那今天的我们的演讲者呢，就是属于这种大家耳熟能详，不用介绍就知道的这个 AI 大神。那这个这几天呢，我们看各个大报章杂志呢，都有很多的，就是在就是在报道，就是呃 ，Professor 呃，这个这个 Andrew 呢，他不管是在呃呃跟跟数位部部长，不管是在很多的场合，都有很多相关的对这个 AI 的这个相关的分享。我想大家都知道，他是 AI 的这个呃，他是 AI 的先驱、教育者，还有倡议者。他的这个 Google p l a n 呢，大家耳熟能详。那他。他的研究，还有他很多的这个整个教育格局呢，都深深的影响到了全世界。那他呢所开创出来这个 Coursera， 也提供了一个很好的 learning 的 online 的平台，让大家可以用最最第一手的这个这个这个机会呢，学习到不管是 deep learning 还是这个 machine learning 相关的这个知识。那他今天呢，非常呃这个呃呃。呃呃，非常，我们非常的荣幸，请到他来跟我们分享这个 AI 相关的这个呃整个趋势。那他会跟我们介绍，我们还我们有我除了介绍 AI 的趋势之外，我们有哪些的这个机会？特别是这个整个这个 Chat 这个 GPT 的这个发展，对我们不管是在教育、经济、文化各个层面影响都很大。可是同时，它也带来了一些风险跟挑战。那所以他今天会来跟我们分享相关的这些相关的这个发展。那哦，我就不讲太多哈，我们要把这个时间留给他。那我就讲到这里哈，那就谢谢大家，谢谢。Thank you, Fu Xiao. Fu Xiao, thank you everyone for、um, joining me here today and for permitting me to speak with all of you.、Um, I've been looking forward to visiting Taiwan for quite some time. We all know that the whole world counts on Taiwan for a lot of hardware, semiconductor, server manufacturing, and so on.、Um, and I think that there are a lot of opportunities here in Taiwan for there to be. Uh, AI and software to be done work, work to be done as well. So what I hope to do today is、um, share with you what I think are some exciting global opportunities in AI, and also touch on some of the things that、um, I hope maybe some of you or maybe collaboration opportunities in the future may allow us to pursue here in Taiwan. So、um, I've been saying for a few years now that AI is the new electricity. And I've been saying that because <clears throat> one of the tricky things to understand about AI is is a general purpose technology.、Um, and in fact, if if I was to ask you what is electricity good for, it's almost hard to answer that because electricity is another general purpose technology that's useful for so many things. It's almost difficult to name one or two things. And this is why when we ask what is AI good for, it's almost hard to answer that because it's useful for so many different things. Um, and just like electricity revolutionized the world, starting about a hundred years ago, AI is now increasingly doing the same. So I'd like to start off with a description of the technology landscape, and then this will lead into a discussion of some of the opportunities ahead of all of us. There's a lot of buzz and excitement about AI, and I think a good way to think about AI is as a collection of tools. So, for example, one tool that has worked quite well for 10, 15 years now is supervised learning, which is good at labeling things. And then there's a new entrant, generative AI.、Um, and if you study AI, you may have heard of other tools as well. But for today's presentation, I want to focus on what I think are the two most important tools, which are supervised learning, good at labeling things, as well as generative AI.、Um, so, supervised learning is technology that Given an input, let us label it with an output. So, given an input A, label it with an output B. And this started to work really well 10, 15 years ago with the rise of deep learning. And for example, given an email, we label it with is this spam or not? The spam filtering. The most lucrative application of this that I've worked on, not the most inspiring, but very lucrative, was、uh, online advertising. We're given an ad. We can label if this is an ad that you're more likely to click. And for a single company like Google, this drives more than 100 billion U.S. dollars a year in, in incremental ad revenue.、Um, 
Or for self-driving cars, we can input a picture of what's in front of the car, label it with the other pos positions of the other cars. Uh, one of the projects we worked on was uh, ship route optimization. Given a ship route, label it with the amount of fuel we think it'll consume. We use that to make ships more fuel efficient. Um, we also do a lot of work on uh, inspection. So given a picture of a phone that's just been manufactured, we can inspect it for defects. And we actually work with many um, manufacturing companies uh, in different sectors in Taiwan on, on inspection tasks. Uh, or given a restaurant review, we can label that review as having a positive or negative sentiment for reputation monitoring. And the thing I want to point out is just the tool of supervised learning is useful for all of these very, very diverse opportunities, which is an illustration of um, supervised learning as a general purpose technology. And it actually took us you know, 10 plus years to find and build a lot of the use cases. And we're still not yet done finding uses of supervised learning. But if we look back at, um, and, but, but look at the process of building an AI system using supervised learning, this is what it looks like, right? If you want to build, su use supervised learning to read restaurant reviews for sentiment tracking of customers, this is what you do. First, you have to collect a data set of uh, pieces of text and label. So for example, if you review that says, this oyster omelet is amazing, you know, there's a positive sentiment, um, or uh, 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 oyster omelet, that's what O-O is the end, is that, is that how I say it right? Um, say several slow, that's negative, um, or my favorite done bean, you know, that's positive. And so the typical workflow for supervised learning is you first collect a data set with maybe thousands of examples like this. I've shown three, but we may build systems with thousands of examples. And then you train an AI model, then find a cloud service um, uh, to run the AI model. They can input, you know, best Tintu nights I've ever had. And this will say that's a positive review of your restaurant's food. Um, and if we were to look back on the last decade, I think the last decade was a decade of large-scale supervised learning. What we found about 10 plus 10, 10, 12, 15 years ago was if we have a lot of data and we feed it to a small neural network, a small deep learning model, its performance would go like that. It would improve for a while, but then as you fed even more data, its performance wouldn't get that much better. But we found about 15 years ago that if you were to build a very large neural network using many GPUs or a lot of compute power, then as we fed it more and more data, its performance would get better and better. So this is why when I, was, when I started uh, and was leading the Google Brain team, the primary mission that I set for the team in the early days was I said, hey, let's just build really, really large neural networks using Google's compute resources. And fortunately, that recipe worked. And having more data, more compute um, drove and continues to drive a lot of AI progress. Uh, uh, and, and so this recipe, still works, but this, this recipe really drove a lot of progress in the last decade. Um, I think this scaling also set us up for generative AI. And I think this decade is turning to be maybe the decade of not replacing, but adding generative AI as another tool to our toolbox in addition to supervised learning. So hopefully many of you will have used tools like ChatGPT or Bing Chat or Bard, um, but with generative AI, you can input a prompt, um, like I love eating, and then if you run it once, maybe it'll say mango shaved ice or mom's a lu rou fan um, or tou dofu. Um, and, and that's the AI output. Now, um, I know that you know, this, this seems, when, when many people tried uh, this type of text generation process, it seemed almost magical, right? But I want to take just half a slide to explain the core of how generative AI works um, to demystify what it does. And it turns out, that the core of generative AI is actually supervised learning. Um, and specifically, generative AI is built by using supervised learning to repeatedly predict the next word. So for example, if um, a large AI system has read on the internet a sentence like, my favorite food is tomato scrambled eggs, fan xie dan, right? Um, then this is turned into a number of data points, training examples for supervised learning to learn to predict the next word. For example, in this um, sentence, if it sees my favorite food is, and it's asked to predict what's the next word, the right answer is tomato. Or if it sees my favorite food is tomato, the next word it should predict is scrambled, and so on. If it's scrambled, next word is egg. And if you train a very large AI model, 
a very large transformer network on a lot of data, hundreds of billions of words, or in some cases, more than a trillion words, then you get a large language model like ChatGPT. Um, and I'm omitting important technical details. So technically, we don't train to predict the next word. We train to predict the next token, which is usually a sub part of a word. Um, there are also other techniques like instruction tuning and uh, ROHF to further improve the ability of the OM to follow instructions. But just at the first, for first approximation, large language models work like this by using supervised learning to repeatedly predict the next word. And we do that at scale. You get these really pretty miraculous results. So, Many of you will be familiar with prompting as a consumer tool, where you go to ChatGPT or Bard and just use it. Um, and I use it frequently myself. I think it's fantastic. It makes me more efficient in my work. But um, in addition to prompting as a consumer tool, I think it is also revolutionizing application development. It's also a fantastic developer tool. So um, I want to illustrate this with an example. If, if you were to use supervised learning, to build, say, the restaurant sentiment classification. Given the restaurant review, is this a positive or negative sentiment? Using the traditional supervised learning approach, this is what the workflow would look like. We first get a label data set. Maybe it'll take me a month to collect a thousand examples. Um, then we build and train an AI model. Maybe it takes us three months to get it to work quite well. And then we find a cloud service to deploy it, make it rugged, you know, regression testing, maintenance, and maybe it'll take us three months to get it to be really robust and up and running. Um, I know this will seem like a very slow timeline to you, right? Somebody thinking, oh, I could throw this together over a week in a Jupyter notebook. Um, but the, to, to deploy a robust, rugged, commercial-grade machine learning system, this is actually a pretty realistic timeline. Um, and so many AI teams, very good AI teams I've worked with, you know, we really took six to 12 months to build and deploy a robust AI system. In contrast with prompting, this is what the workflow looks like. Um, we would specify a prompt <clears throat> that maybe takes minutes or hours, uh, and then we can deploy the model, and that often takes hours or days. And so I find it very exciting that with large language models, not just as a consumer tool, but as a developer tool, there are now a lot of applications that hundreds of thousands of people around the world, maybe millions of people around the world, can build in maybe a week that something that used to take me you know, six months to build. And I think this is exciting because um, prompting as a, as a developer tool is already starting just in the early stages of letting there be a flourishing of a lot of new AI applications that used to be so hard to build, but is now so much easier to build. So let me actually show you um, an example of this. Let's see. All right, I know you probably weren't expecting me to write code in this presentation, but that's what I'm going to do. So it turns out this is all the code I need in order to build a sentiment classifier. Um, I'm going to import some tools from OpenAI. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, no. Oops. Team. Oh, and so just to point out, the prompt is classify the text below, delimited by three dashes as having either a positive or negative sentiment, right? Something like that. Um, and then I've never run this before. Let's we'll see if it works. Right. Oh, and we're on. Okay, good. Thank goodness that worked. Right. And so this says this is a positive sentiment. Um, but this is literally all the code it takes. Oh, sorry. Scrolled off the bottom there. Right, pause this in a minute. All right. <laughs> um, and this is literally all the code it takes someone to write to build a sentiment classifier. Um, and so, cool. uh, and so this is um, leading to flourishing a lot of new AI applications that that a lot of people can therefore now build much more easily. Um, in fact, one of the things that my team, DeepLearning.ai, um, has been doing, uh, also sometimes uh, with, often with Coursera, is work on courses on 
teaching how to use generative AI, not just as a consumer tool, but as a developer tool. So over the last you know, many months, we've been working with um, many industry experts, including OpenAI, AWS, Langchain, Lambda, Hugging Me, Google, Microsoft, Wiz, Bicycle here. Uh, there are also a few unannounced partners that we're working with, but just haven't announced the causes yet. But I think pretty much all the leading generative AI companies, I think we're working with pretty much all of them um, to, to provide this type of training on developer tools. And there are, um, you know, I don't know, well, over a million learners that have been taking these short courses. So I'm excited about just the number of people that would really use um, these capabilities. And also, one of the reasons I've been meaning to visit Taiwan for some time is because, not sure if, if, if you all know, but uh, the deep learning.ai engineering team is actually here in Taiwan. So actually, Joe Chen is here in the audience as well. He's the head of engineering for, do you want to raise your hand, Joe? Well, Joe's in China. So he's head of engineering for um, deep learning.ai, but we have our software engineering team is all here and, and actually built this global platform to serving, you know, frankly, learners all around the world. So I'm, I'm quite proud that, that our team in Taiwan um, built this global platform that many, many learners are counting on to learn about these skills. And because we have a team in Taiwan, I think uh, hopefully that sets us up for you know, future interactions and collaborations and, and hopefully gives me more of an excuse to visit Taiwan more often as well. Now, um, so Hopefully, for, with, with that, talk about supervised learning technology and generative AI technology and generative AI as a developer too. I'd like to share a little bit about how I see the set of AI opportunities ahead of all of us. Um, so this shows what I think is the value in terms of, say, revenue generated from, from customers of different AI technologies today. Um, and what it will grow into, the expanded circles, what it will grow into three years from now. Right? So on the left, the large green circle is supervised learning. Uh, for a company like Google, worth more than $100 billion, US dollars a year in revenue, and there are millions of developers working on supervised learning. So I think it will you know, plausibly double in three years and go from huge to even bigger. So a lot of momentum is supervised learning because for the last decade, we've had so many people working on it and there are just millions of developers working on supervised learning. Uh, generative AI is a new entrant and people will be surprised how small I drew the circle. Um, I think generative AI is very exciting, but because it's a general purpose technology, realistically, it's gonna take us a long time, more than I wish. It's gonna take us time to identify and build many of the concrete use cases. There are already some very valuable use cases. So the ChatGPT, BOD, Midjourney, you know, character AI, uh, uh, but there are already some really valuable use cases, but there will be a lot more over the next decade that we'll be figuring out and building. And so even though I drew generative AI's value, uh, financial value, say, from, from customer usage, it's pretty small from now, I think it will much more than double in the next three years. And if it continues to grow at this compounded rate, you know, this exponential rate, then maybe in six years, instead of three years, it'll be even much larger. So some people look at this slide and say, hey, how come you think generative AI is small? It's, that's not the message of this. It is small now, but it's growing very rapidly. So I think it's an exciting uh, uh, opportunity to invest in. But the light shaded region is what I think represents the magnitude of the growth um, over the next few years. What I hope you take away from this portion of the presentation is um, AI technologies are general purpose technologies. And um, a lot of value that remains to be created using supervised learning, but generative AI is another major tool, uh, creating even more opportunities. So we aren't even done finding ways to use supervised learning, but now we have another tool on our toolbox, and, and that's very exciting. Now, but with one important caveat, um, is that there will be fads along the way. I'm curious, how many of you, raise your hand if you remember the word, if, you, if you've heard of Lenza or remember the app Lenza? Oh, okay, yeah, a couple people, not many. So Lenza was this app, um, it actually is still, still around, that lets you upload a dozen pictures or so of yourself and it draw a really cool picture of you as an astronaut or scientist or something. Um, and it was a good idea. It was a really, really well done app. So its revenues took off like that through last December, it just grew really quickly, and it was widely covered in the news through December, and then it did that. Right? And I think this is because Lenza turned out to be one of the first, one early of unfortunately many apps, that was a thin software layer 
built on top of someone else's very powerful APIs. Um, and it was a good idea. It was a very good product, but it just wasn't a long-term defensible business. Um, and when, when I think about the fads in generative AI, I'm, I'm reminded of when you know, Steve Jobs gave us a smartphone. Um, then there were also fads built on top of the iPhone development platform. Early in the iPhone development, someone built an app to do this, to turn on the flashlight, and sold this for $1.99, and I paid for it. But clearly, this was not, this, this wound up being not a long-term defensible business as well, even though it was also a good idea to turn on the flashlight on the phone. But just as with the phone, um, some others figured out how to build Uber and Airbnb and Tinder, those really valuable, really long-term valuable applications that created value for a lot of people with the new generative AI platform as a developer platform, there will be opportunities to build really exciting applications that create long-term value, and that's what I'm excited about. Um, so, first trend, generative AI is a general purpose technology with a lot of use cases to be figured out, and AI is a general purpose technology, I say. There's a second trend I want to touch on, which relates to why AI isn't more widely adopted yet. Um, and this is just a customization of the long tail problem. So, uh, and, and I want to tell you, because it feels like we've been talking about, many of us have been talking about AI for 15, 20 years now, right? But, but a lot of the value of AI is still concentrated in tech companies or consumer internet and tech companies. This is why I think it's been like that. If you were to take all current and potential AI projects and sort them in decreasing order of value, you get a curve that looks like this, where to the left, are the really valuable AI projects like building a single ad system for a company like Google um, or building a better web search engine. And in consumer software internet, um, about 15 years ago, my friends and I figured out a recipe where we can say hire 100 engineers, have 100 engineers build one AI system that serves a billion users and generates massive financial value. So we know how to do that. This was and still is valuable. People are still doing this. But the problem with this recipe is once you go outside the consumer software internet sector, once you go outside tech companies, almost no one has 100 million or a billion users that you can apply one AI system to. In contrast, these are some of the projects I've been working on and I'm excited about. Um, we're working with a pizza maker, pizza, pizza factory, that needs to take pictures of the pizza um, to make sure that the cheese is spread evenly. This turns out to be about a $5 million uh, uh, project, but you can't hire 100 engineers to work on a $5 million project. Yeah. Um, or you know, there's a lot of agriculture in Taiwan, but we're actually working with an agriculture machinery company that, um, and we're taking pictures of the fields of wheat. And it turns out that you can figure out how tall the wheat is. Sometimes the wheat is bent over because of wind or rain. And we can chop off the wheat at the right height by adjusting the height of the harvesting arm of the harvester. Then we get more wheat uh, for the farmer to sell. So there's more money for the farmer. It's actually better for the environment. But this is another $5 million project. And you just can't hire dozens or like 100 engineers to work on a project like this. Um, and then also, in, in, actually in Taiwan, we actually have uh, partners and customers that do a lot of material grading, um, you know, metal grading, cloth grading, um, and, and I see a lot of these, let's call them $5 million projects. And the trick, of course, is even though there's a small number of billion dollar projects to the left, I'm seeing tens of thousands of $5 million projects that no one's been able to effectively execute on. And I think the aggregate value, the total value of all the projects in the tail to the right is I think even greater than the value in the head of this curve. But the dilemma is how do we work on 10,000 projects unless you know, I try to hire 10,000 machine learning engineers, right? which is pretty difficult. So fortunately, the new trend is um, uh, AI community, we're developing better tools to enable the end user to do the customization. Um, and so low code and no code tools, and, and people talk about low and no code. I, I spend more time on low code actually than no code. Um, uh, but I think low code tools and to a less extent no code tools are increasingly letting the end user customize the AI system. So what this means, for example, is um, we now have tools that lets the IT departments of the pizza factory use their own pictures of pizzas to build their own custom AI system 
and realize this $5 million of value without me needing to be the one to go and you know, work on this pizza application myself. And these tools um, allow the users to either prompt a system uh, or provide data using a technology that we call data-centric AI. And this is enabling a lot more custom AI systems to be built without, with, with, without, you know, uh, 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 without needing to, to write a lot of code in TensorFlow and PyTorch, which is just more difficult. Um, and I think this recipe is important because this seems to me key to take a lot of the value of AI and move it from just concentrated in the tech companies, internet sector, to all other industries, which tend to have these many, many, but much more diverse and fragmented examples. So look in the future, um, I'm excited to see AI's value go from tech to all industries. So given these two trends, first, AI is a general purpose technology with a lot of applications to be built. And second, AI making its way from valuable mainly in tech to valuable in all industries. Um, what, where, 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 where does that leave us? The puzzle I wanted to solve about five years ago was I felt that many valuable AI projects um, were possible because of supervised learning. And this is even more true now with generative AI. And the puzzle I wanted to solve was um, how do we get all of these different projects done? So I felt five years ago that starting new companies uh, would be an efficient way to do this uh, because um, even though I had led AI teams in large tech companies like Google and Baidu, I couldn't imagine how I could lead a team in a big internet company to go after as diverse a set of opportunities as I felt you know, I wanted to pursue. And so I think starting new companies is an efficient way to do this. And of course, there are also many opportunities for incumbent companies uh, to find ways to integrate AI into the existing businesses. And in fact, I know that uh, it's been interesting. I had, I, I had uh, lunch with um, many uh, 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 Taida professors just now. It was actually really exciting to see the number of collaborations, either with startups or with big companies like NVIDIA and others, um, to facilitate this type of uh, idea generation and back and forth. You know, opportunity growth. But just to be concrete about these opportunities, um, this is what I think of as the AI stack. Right? So at the lowest level is the uh, hardware or maybe the semiconductor layer. And I know Jensen Huang and Lisa Su were both in town uh, uh, fairly recently. And I think that the hardware layer is very capital intensive, very concentrated. Right? So TSMC, you know, UMC, uh, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, I think these are fantastic you know, businesses, uh, but I don't personally try to start companies here because it's so capital intensive and so concentrated. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited about the uh, uh, hardware roadmap of uh, not just NVIDIA, but I find that AMD's MI250, MI300 is actually getting you know, really good. So my team's actually use, uh, I know a lot of buzz on, on, on NVIDIA, and, uh, uh, but, but as I say, I, I think Rockham is getting quite usable as well, surprisingly. Um, so, but so, but so this, this is very valuable, but in terms of starting new companies, I don't personally play there myself. Um, a second key part of the AI stack is the software infrastructure, clouds. Again, great opportunities here, uh, but it's also very capital intensive, meaning it least needs a lot of resources to build very concentrated, meaning there are relatively few winners. So I don't really try to build companies here as well. Um, one of the exciting sector is developer tools. So what I showed you, the way I was using OpenAI API just now with a coding example, that was using OpenAI as a developer tool. And I view developer tools as hyper-competitive. You look at all the startups chasing OpenAI, but um, my team does build developer tools when we think we have a significant technology advantage. Because I think even though it's hyper-competitive developer tools, there will be some huge, hugely impactful businesses to be built and when we have a significant technology advantage, we've invented a unique technology, I think that gives us a shot at building one of the businesses, one of the companies that could be one of the huge ones. So we play here carefully, uh, only when we're technology advantage. And then lastly, whenever there's a new wave of technology, a lot of the media attention tends to be on the infra tooling, you know, the infrastructure layer. Um, and we see this with generative AI as well. A lot of the media attention is on this layer. But it turns out that for these types of businesses to be successful, there's one other layer that needs to be even more successful, um, and that's the application layer. Because for the tools to be successful, the applications built on top have to be even more successful so they can 
generate the revenue to pay the tooling companies. So I actually spend a lot of my time working on different applications. Um, so for example, last few days I've been um, uh, sending messages with the CEO of Amorai, uh, some, some announcement coming out at some point. Um, but uh, Amorai is an interesting case study because we're working on AI applied to romantic relationship coaching, right? And, you know, I'm an AI guy. I feel like I don't know anything about romance. And if you don't believe me, you can check with my wife and she will confirm that I know nothing about romance. Um, but we're able to uh, work on this because when, when my team AI fund, um, so, so I started AI fund to build new companies to, to do this, but when my team AI fund decided uh, we wanted to um, do something on AI applied to romance, we wound up partnering with uh, the former CEO of Tinder. Her name's Renata Nyborg. And Renata knows much more than anyone else I know in a systematic way about relationships. And so with my team providing the AI technology expertise and Renate providing the relationship expertise, we're able to partner together uh, to build something really unique in you know, romantic or relationship mentoring. Right? And just a shout out, is Eva Wang, um, who's actually from Taiwan, is uh, um, uh, kind of a, works with me closely at AI Fund. And maybe fun fact, uh, Eva had helped me get AI Fund going uh, in the early days. So she made herself employee number one of AI Fund and I'm employee number two of it. But this is uh, also a strong Taiwan connection over there. Um, but what I want to do is just share with you, you know, how we build startups. This is our process of building startups. So we've always had discussions with a lot of people about ideas, right? about ideas for things we could build. And I want to illustrate our process with one example, which is a startup that we built um, using AI to make shipping more fuel efficient. Um, and so a few years ago, a large Japanese conglomerate that operates a line of ships came to me and they said, hey, Andrew, you should use AI to make ships more fuel efficient. And I want to point out, this is another idea that I would never have had myself, you know, because like, I, what do I know about global maritime shipping? But they actually came to us with an idea and said, use a, build Google Maps for ships to suggest the ship how to steer to get to a destination on time and use about, it turns out to be about 10% less fuel. Um, and so when we have an idea, our standard process is to spend up to a month to validate that the idea is technically feasible and that there's a users that would like to use it, market demand. If it passes this, we then go to recruit a CEO to build this with us. And in this case, we found uh, Dylan Kayo, who's a fantastic entrepreneur with one successful company exit before. And then we spent three months with them uh, building a technical prototype, you know, writing software, having deep customer conversations. Um, and if the company survives this stage, it survives about 66% of the time, we then fund the company and this is company enough resources to hire executives and keep growing um, and, and hopefully go out and raise additional capital. And so thanks to us, thanks to Mitsui suggesting this idea to us and us working with Dylan to build this, today there are hundreds of ships, many hundreds of ships on the high seas, large vessels um, that are being steered by Bering AI they use about 10% less fuel. And this turns out to be about half a million US dollars in fuel savings per ship per year, um, as well as reduced carbon emissions. And in terms of my role, you know, I, I've learned that my swim lane, my role is to try to provide the AI technical expertise, which turns out to be important for technical validation, um, to make sure the tech is built well, and also to bring in a strong technical team. Um, so let's see. I might skip over this in just time. All right. So I've talked a lot about uh, building, you know, the process of using AI technology to build different AI projects and different AI businesses. Um, I want to switch tracks a little bit and talk a little bit about technology trends as well. And um, I want to share with you some, some work that my team Landing AI has been doing on computer vision. Um, specifically on the trend of vision prompting, because we've already seen uh, the text processing revolution here through large language models. And I feel like large vision models instead of LMs, LVMs are increasingly changing the way we process images as well. 
uh, before talking about the technology, I just want to mention, you know, so Lending AI, because of manufacturing, we work with many customers in Taiwan. Many of them I cannot talk about because of just confidentiality. But I just want to share one fun project. So this is uh, Professor Yi Yang from National uh, Chung Kun University. That this is one of those projects I would never have thought of doing this myself, right? But this is a project which um, has a cloud chamber. So there's a cloud chamber down there yeah, with, with lots of fog. And um, uh, pr uh, Professor Yang's group was using our computer vision software. So it turns out that when a cosmic ray strikes the cloud chamber, it leaves a streak behind. And uh, they use you know, our computer vision software in order to detect these streaks that indicate that the cosmic ray just came from outer space through Earth and struck this, this, this chamber, this cloud chamber, leaving a, a, a condens condensation trail uh, in, in the cloud chamber. And, and, and so I just highlight this because this is running you know, here in Tainan right now. Um, and I think when we have exciting technology and partners with subject matter, what, what do I know about cosmic rays? You know, these exciting opportunities uh, end up happening. And I was kind of bummed I don't have an opportunity from Taida to show, maybe hopefully next time <laughs> with collaborations. I'd love to show collaboration with Taida. Um, but I want to share with you what's, what's happening uh, in, in vision, which is text prompting has transformed text, sorry, prompting has transformed text processing. And I think visual prompting takes the idea of prompting from text to vision. So let me just show you, let me just go ahead and show you a demo of this. Um, let's see. So, okay, so if I want to learn to recognize this dog, I'm going to swipe a few pixels and then hit run. Um, and when I'm swiping a few pixels, we call that a visual prompt. So I drew a few, you know, uh, purple pixels on top of the dog, and I drew a few yellow pixels uh, not on top of the dog. And this takes about 10, 15 seconds to run, right? Which, okay, good, not bad. And now, you know, it's learned that this yellow, this purple part is the dog, and the yellow part is not. Um, but let's say, let's say I'm actually not that satisfied with this result, right? In this case, I think the leash should be part of the dog. So I'm going to continue the visual conversation and say, you know, hey, this stuff should be part of the dog, and then rerun it, um, but like like a like a, a, a chat bot, but having a conversation in the visual image space. So previously, it would have taken me maybe a well months or maybe days to build a computer vision system to detect this. Oh, good, this worked. Oh, not bad. Yeah, all right. Now it knows the leash is part of the dog. Right, um, and maybe one, one other example. Uh, so one of our users, so today there are actually a lot of uh, biology graduate students, you know, and often PhDs in research labs, looking at uh, under a microscope slides to count cells in a petri dish. Oh, these are actually cell colonies. I'm gonna say, you know, this stuff, the purple stuff is a cell, the yellow stuff is not. And you're literally seeing me build a computer vision system in seconds using visual prompting. And so, um, literally, there are many, you know, PhD research scientists in biology kind of counting cells, or these are cell colonies under a petri dish. And you saw it took me like, what was that, 10 seconds, 15 seconds to build a computer vision system. And yeah, it's not perfect, it missed a few, but you know, if I reprompt this and run this again, they'll get better and can iterate. It would give me like 60 seconds, and you know, 10 seconds, and I'll build an even better computer vision system than this. Or maybe just one more relevant to inspection. So if I want to inspect cracks, you know, I can say that's part of a crack. This stuff is not. Let's give a little bit more data maybe. Yeah, all right, let's run it. Um, so we do a lot of inspection work as well. So it's general purpose computer vision platform but we started visual prompting work with um, inspection, often a lot, a lot of manufacturing inspection work. That's why the strong, yeah, okay, oh, not bad. 
right? And so it's learned to detect tracks in just a few seconds. Um, right now, it doesn't work for everything. It works better for tasks that are more um, texture or color based, but for applications that works, they actually, you know, really built, built and deployed vision systems in seconds. And the technology I want to share with you is this. Um, in 2017, my former team published the text transformers paper. And since then, there was a lot of innovation with many teams building on top of each other. You know, GPT-2, GPT-3, um, GitHub Copilot, Instruct GPT, Chinchilla, Palm, uh, Bing Chat, ChatGPT, and so on. Right? And so we've seen a text processing revolution. It was about less widely known. It was about three years later, 2020, that same team, Google Brain, published the Vision Transformer paper. And since then, there's been a wave of innovation by many groups, including most, most notably Meta, building on top of Vision Transformers and, and just improving the technology rapidly. I was at the CVPR conference earlier this year, Computer Vision Conference. I spoke at a workshop and uh, Vision, but, but what I'm seeing there is, um, you know, a, a couple of years before ChatGPT, there was a buzz in NLP. Everyone, people kind of knew something was happening. And in computer vision today, something's happening. People know something's happening, even though exactly how this will come to fruition is not totally clear. Um, and in fact, just yesterday, OpenAI announced the uh, release of GPT-4V, GPT-4 with vision. And I think it's another nice step. It's not the final solution yet. I see a lot of benefits, also some limitations, but I feel like the AI community is just, computer vision will get much better in the next few years. So if you're, um, uh, and I find that exciting. And why this is happening is because of the following. A lot of progress uh, in text and now vision was driven by large transformers pre-trained on large amounts of data. Uh, training was with unlabeled data. This is true for text and is increasingly true for vision. Uh, with some, no with some example, notable exceptions like SAM from Meta, but more and more work is with unlabeled data or self-supervised unlabeled data. So you have a lot of data available. And um, scaling up model data size and data is helping transformers generalize given only a simple input prompt that partially, but hopefully unambiguously, specifies the task, which is why we now have not just large language models, but large vision models. Um, there are some differences between text and vision as well. I think one of the differences is uh, whereas internet text generalizes to your text, internet images doesn't generalize as well to the commercial applications of a vision where the images tend to look quite different. So this is also the pretext task for computer vision. So it's not that satisfactory. So the differences as well, but I see the research community innovating and building on top of this, which is why I think there'll be a um, coming revolution in computer vision. That, that's uh, coming quite clear. All right, so talk about options in AI, building projects, selecting projects. I'm just gonna wrap up with a few slides on risk and social impact. We'd love to take everyone's questions. Um, you know, so my teams only work on projects that we think move humanity forward, and, and just, just for, it's kind of, we do, and we have multiple times, and we continue to, co-projects that we assess to be financially sound, but on, based on ethical grounds. I think with AI as a very powerful tool, it's important that we all, um, well, let, let's all only work on things that we consider responsible and beneficial for people. Uh, AI has some risks as well. I think AI today has problems with bias, fairness, accuracy, uh, but it's actually getting much better rapidly. And I think the biggest realistic risk is it will disrupt many occupations. Um, this is a chart from a study uh, done by some friends at U University of Pennsylvania as well as OpenAI that showed the exposure of different jobs to automation by AI. And unlike earlier ways of automation where the lower wage jobs were more impacted, today this is wage on the horizontal axis the higher wage jobs on the right have a higher degree of exposure to AI. But so um, I think that AI will create a lot more jobs than it destroys. And I think in many cases, people that use AI will replace people that don't use AI. So many jobs are staying, but there will be jobs that will be affected. And I think um, uh, with our you know, responsibility to make sure people are well taken care of, uh, even as we build AI technology that creates a lot of value. Um, and then lastly, then the last slide, I feel like a lot of hype about AGI, artificial general intelligence, the most widely accepted definition of AGI is AI that can do any intellectual task that a human can do. And if you use that definition of AGI, I think that's still many decades away. Um, uh, I, I, I realized recently some, some teams that think 
more optimistic about AGI is because they redefine AGI. If you redefine AGI to be low standard, then you know, of course it's easier to get there. But with the original definition of AGI, um, it turns out that digital intelligences have taken a very different path than biological intelligences. And to require digital intelligences to do everything biological intelligence can do is just really difficult. So I don't see a clear path to get there in a few years, but I certainly hope we'll get there within our lifetimes. Um, and then the other you know, perceived risk of AI is, is AI creating extinction risk for humanity. I think that's wildly overhyped. Um, human society has lots of experience controlling, steering very powerful entities, more powerful than any single person, such as corporations and nation states. And while not perfect, for the most part, corporations and nation states have been steered to benefit people. So I'm very confident that as AI develops, we'll continue to be able to steer it as well. And I think also the hard takeoff scenario where it suddenly achieves super intelligence overnight and takes over the world overnight, that's, that's just not realistic. Um, and as it develops slowly, our ability to steer it is also growing with it. And in fact, if we were to look at the real existential risk to humanity, things like the next pandemic, you know, fingers crossed, um, hopefully not, or climate change leading to massive depopulation of huge parts of the planet, um, or maybe another asteroid wiping us out like it did the dinosaurs, much lower probability, it turns out. I think that if we look at the real existential risk to humanity, AI will be a key part of the solution, of our solution to these challenges. So if you want humanity to survive and thrive for the next thousand years, rather than slowing down AI as some people propose, I think we should instead try to make AI go as fast as possible. Um, so that, let me say, you know, thank you all very much, and I hope that uh, we'll have more opportunities to, to interact and find ways to collaborate in the future as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for Dr. Andrew's very informative and insightful talk. And now it's time for question and answer. Uh, if you want to raise any question, please raise your hand. Okay, here, the first one. Hey, hello. Um, I want to ask, what's the problem we are currently facing in deep learning research field, and what's the direction you expect it to solve them? Thank you. Boy. Yeah, so, boy. There's so many research problems. Um, one thing about AI is it's grown to be so big, um, there are many different directions I find very exciting to pursue right now. So it's almost hard to name one or two. Um, so I feel like, um, yeah, you know, I think that scaling up as a vector of growth is still not yet tapped out. So I think it's continue to scale up, you know, LLMs and LVMs. I think that will continue to see improved performance. Um, even though I touched on large vision models on, on the vision revolution, I feel like today's algorithms of vision, there are a lot of things that are not satisfying about them. So for example, um, the way we tokenize text, the way we take text, turns into tokens, the feed into an OM, that seems to work well. The tokenization process is non-lossy, it, it seems to work well. The way we tokenize images, the way we take an image, cut to patches, run you know, kind of um, uh, some sort of clustering thing, it, it feels very unsatisfying. And the way, uh, the way we train um, LLMs and L is we make up a supervised learning task by predicting the next token or predicting the next word. But the way we make up a task called a pretext task of vision, where we hide some patches and predict other patches, it feels not very satisfying. So a lot of vision researchers are trying to figure out you know, different ways to train a, a, a vision transformers. So I find that quite exciting. Um, another direction I find exciting is uh, I think that I've been talking about data-centric AI for, for, for a couple of years, and it's been interesting. So data-centric AI is the discipline of entering the data to build a successful AI system, where we all like to download the data set and you know, hold the data set, fix and tune the model. But a lot of the times, the practical applications, it's more fruitful to hold the model fix and just tune the data. Um, and in fact, with large pre-trained models, the data set sizes we need are smaller than ever. So with, you know, 10 data points or 10 examples plus a large pre-trained model of a visual prompting. You saw me build things with like two images, right? But what are the user interfaces, the principles and the tools, the engineering, the data? I see a lot of um, uh, excitement on that. 
I was actually tracking on Google Scholars the number of research papers on data-centric AI, and it's still kind of on that rapid exponential looking takeoff of just the past couple of years. So that's another um, exciting set of applications. Um, I don't know, yeah, it, it feels like, sorry, it feels, it feels like this is a lot to do. I, I think, by the way, if, if, I, if I, you know, didn't already have a full-time job and I could just go spend years to do research on whatever I felt like doing, I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time on unsupervised learning research. Actually, I, I, I wish I had more time to do research there myself. I find that whole sector, um, unsupervised learning on a lot of unlabeled data, uh, and, and how that relates to how biological intelligence works. I, I would actually love to, if I had more time, I would do more research on that myself. You talked about using AI to move humanity forward and uh, by extension AI for good. So, but in my, exper in my experience, some of these kind of problems are part of the long tail. They, are, they cannot be easily solved by drag and drop tools. So they already uh, require a lot of the experienced data scientists. Uh, so what's your recommendation for this kind of, not the scalable problems, but uh, very important? Yeah, no, there's some problems that we just have to find a lot of data scientists and machine learning engineers to work on them, and, and it'll be worth it for the important applications. Um, I want to share one other thing, though. So what I'm seeing is that um, uh, in terms of the skill set needed, I, I know when I said low code, no code, I actually am bullish on low code um, for, for a few reasons. Um, so it turns out what I'm seeing is that I think that there are long-term problems that need a lot of data scientists. There are also a lot of long-term problems that need just a little bit of low-code skill. And what I'm seeing is, um, uh, it turns out, you know, people, I think that we're moving toward this fantastic future. We can tell, a, you know, mid-journey what image you want, or tell a chat GPT or bot what text you want, and it just does it for you. I think that's fantastic. But um, Chinese or English as a language is still ambiguous, right? English language or Chinese language is ambiguous. So one of the reasons I, I, I encourage, you know, frankly, everyone to learn to code is because um, if you write Python code or whatever language, that's very unambiguous. So when you write Python code, you get the same result every time, right? Within reason. I know you don't always, but you kind of, you kind of do. Um, and so what I'm seeing is that with prompting and a little bit of code, you can actually do a lot more than with only prompting, and also a lot of the integrations. Um, and so I think, uh, so I'm actually seeing a lot of opportunities. We can you know, help more people learn to code just a little bit, and then call APIs, the LMs and LVMs. That lets people do a lot more than if all you knew was how to use a web interface um, for, for, for one of the model providers. So hopefully there'll be lots of opportunities like that as well. Thank you for the insightful talk. And um, you talk about a lot about super, uh, um, distinguishing between supervised learning and uh, generative learning. And one thing that um, people possibly may hesitate to use generative learning is because we know it's less uh, making it hard to, for example, evaluate its true performance. Okay, um, In the best cases, we see very exciting results, but compared with supervised learning, um, in many cases, we don't know how to do proper evaluation. And I'm hoping to hear your opinion about this and how we could counter uh, this difficulty. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a great question. Yeah, there's one very interesting trend I'm seeing with um, drains of AI. So <clears throat> if you take the restaurant review example, <clears throat> if I were to use supervised learning, I may collect a thousand training examples. And then if I'm collecting a thousand training examples, let's hold out a hundred examples of evaluation. So you train, evaluate, know how it works. Um, with prompting, you know, I got that, you, you sold me how I would build a system with zero training examples, right? Or, or sometimes you could do a few shot prompting with maybe five or 10 training examples, which works a little bit better. And it turns out that when, um, it, when you can get something to work with zero or maybe 10 examples, you kind of can't be bothered to go and collect 100 examples just for the evaluation. So what I'm seeing is um, this methodology where Previously, when doing supervised learning, it was so hard to build a system 
we would you know, really make sure we're building the right thing, have a product manager, and make sure there's customer demand, then spend six months, then we ship it. But with generative AI, you can build things so quickly. I see teams in Silicon Valley use the design methodology of, let's just build 10 things, let's ship them all, and then see what happens. And you do evaluate, and you ship it before evaluating. Uh, with one important caveat, which is obviously we should do this only if the systems we deploy don't have significant risk of harm, uh, because you ship a system, has some bias or inaccuracies, it causes harm, that, that, that's bad. We should, with, with systems with those risks, we do have to collect a test data set and evaluate it before we let down the wall. But um, in, uh, in, in visual prompting, if we're inspecting things in the factory and there's even a human backup, there's really not much risk of harm if there's a human backup. So we just ship it and then run it for a few days or run it for a few hours and only if it's working in, in production, you know, then we let it go to the next layer of automation. Um, but I, I think the evaluation, it, it is a problem, but it's a problem that we can build these things so fast that people can't be bothered to collect a test set uh, sometimes. And then I see also very interesting methodologies being applied. Uh, one of them, um, we, we, we go over this in, we go over some examples of this in one of the short courses that um, uh, OpenAI's ease of fold for the night teach on uh, using ChatGPT, where we'll often use an LM to evaluate an LM's output. So we actually, one of the methodologies we use is if an LM outputs a piece of text, we actually prompt an LM to help us judge if this piece of text is a correct summary or chatbot output or something and start to gather statistics. So I think the evaluation sector, actually this is the earlier question, this is actually another, maybe another good research question, but how do we find systematic ways to evaluate um, output in, in, in a way that's practical. Um, oh, my friend Percy Lang at Stanford, you know, he's done really nice work on home, um, holistic evaluation of that. So it's like a hundred, she wrote a 150 page research paper on this, a really, really um, in-depth evaluation. Uh, and then I think also in, in, in uh, practice and in industry, the way that people evaluate is, you know, has, has other ways as well. So the study and the bridge that gap between academia and practice. I think that, that that's maybe another exciting research topic. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. My name is Bill, the co-founder and CEO at Preteeth AI. Uh, our AI software makes designing dental crown easier. And a dental is like a pizza shop business, uh, scattered, fragmented, low AI, like you shared. Uh, but we can do if we uh, if we can do that we can have lots of potential. So my I guess my question is, uh, do you only rely on inbound ideas from expert to figure out where AI can be useful, and why did you decide to go with uh, the venture studio model instead of just writing a bunch of angel checks to quickly expand your portfolio? Thank you. Oh, so I feel like. Um well, so I decided to build a venture studio model rather than an investor model because I feel like, I don't know, I, I feel like fundamentally I like building things, so I did not want to be the guy that sits around and just, you know, tries to find good investment opportunities. Uh, it's fine if someone does that, it's a noble profession. Oh, actually, in fact, uh, Li Huang, who's here, uh, is an investor, he helped me set things, so it's a noble profession. I just didn't want to do that myself because I felt like, um, my team can add more value you know, to startups if we actually go in and spend a lot of time to look at the technology, help build the technology, um, help recruit the CEO, help recruit the CTO. I think that uses, that lets us add a lot more value. Um, and then frankly, you know, I think uh, I should have a lot more fun just working with entrepreneurs to build things. Um, and then to, to your other question, we, we do rely on um, inbound ideas to some extent because we're fortunate to, so actually, well, there was one slide I skipped over, which is about concrete ideas. So I want to just, maybe I just go over this. You know, there's one weird thing we've learned about building, about how we build startups, right? Which is where do we get ideas from? And the weird thing we've decided is we only want to engage when there's a concrete idea. And here's why. If someone says, hey, Andrew, you should apply AI to financial services. I don't know what to do with that because I'm not an expert in financial services. It's very inefficient for me to learn financial services to kind of come with an idea. But if someone shares, uh, this is a, not a serious idea, it's like a tongue-in-cheek uh, joke. So, someone says, um, you know, buy GT eliminates commercials by automatically buying every product in exchange but not having seen any ads. It's not a good idea, but it is concrete. Um, and we found that concrete ideas can be validated on false side efficiency. 
gives the team a clear direction to execute, just gives you a lot of speed. And one of the things, one of the predictors for whether a startup will be successful, in my opinion, is speed. The good CEOs just execute and make decisions and do things at incredible speed. Um, and and, and what, what I found is that um, because of the widespread excitement about AI, I found that there are actually a lot of subject matter experts in the world today that have thought for months, sometimes even one or two years about an AI application, but they've just not had a partner to work with them to validate and build the idea yet. And so we often um, actually end up hearing from you know, subject matter experts that really know a problem uh, and knows that there's a market gap and we share their idea with us. Um, we, we, we can validate it and then partner with them to get it built really efficiently. So this has been an efficient, repeatable process for us to partner with others to build you know, many different businesses. Uh, and we also have many internally generated ideas uh, when our team internally often has a view on technology uh, or sometimes the application area, but we often work with subject matter experts on this. Okay, okay. Well, Thanks for the inquiry talk. Um, I'm wondering, um, it seems like the reason is that a large model in deep learning depends a lot on the unlimited data you can get from the internet, like text and image, right? So I wonder how this subset can propagate to some modality that you have very few data, like motion. So I work on robot learning and reinforcement learning, so it kind of sad to see like the tiny dot on the landscape slide, but yeah, I'm just wondering how you can um, have the subset in this kind of modality, like motion. So, what did you say motions? Yeah, like human motions, like how you can control the robot and to do things. But we just don't have this like um, commercialized device to capture human motion in general. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like um, uh, when I think very loosely about what information an AI system has, I think there are a few sources of information. Um, in the case of um, LLMs and LVMs with prompting is really a lot of information learned off the internet with a little bit of information specific to your application. So, um, uh, and then if you have only a little bit of information specific to your application, there's one other source of data, which is you know, kind of hand-coded rules or engineered sources of knowledge, right? And I think when you have small amounts of data, you can get machine learning systems to work, but you're more likely to end up having to spend more time doing feature engineering or kind of tuning the algorithm or tuning the architecture. And part of the magic of the LLM and LVM revolution is we have so much data, so much general data off the internet that could have a very general purpose, you know, transformer neural network architecture, just learn from a lot of data and gain all sorts of patterns about language or images or whatever. But when you have only a small amount of data, then, you know, the other source of knowledge is you're hand engineering your knowledge into the system. And then if you do that, which is more time consuming, you also do get systems to, to work on. Um, and maybe despite all the excitement about um, generative AI, it does have one other major limitation, which is it's really working only for unstructured data, specifically text, um, images, audio, maybe video, because these are the types of data where we have you know, huge amounts of data off the internet to learn from. In contrast, uh, not just motion data, but a lot of the world's data is structured data, meaning tabular data, like a spreadsheet. So if I have a spreadsheet that tells me about you know, arrival times and departure time of trucks or something, that's structured data. That's often a very unique data set, and I don't know what, and it turns out if I learn from some other company's logistics data, you know, like ships sailing around, that's not useful for my logistics data, of my trucks driving around Taiwan. And so uh, this is why Gen3 isn't everything. For a lot of the structured data applications, the best tool today is still supervised learning because you don't have that general sources of data to learn from that's still useful for your specific application. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, up there? Oh, cool, awesome. Yes, I see you. Okay. Upstairs. Hi, Andrew. I'm uh, in NTU AI Club and also founding Tokai, a startup in the note-taking industry. And uh, to have the opportunity to briefly meet you yesterday. And I found that the software engineering workflow has been massively transformed with 
uh, OpenAI API and LangChain. And it's just this uh, massive growing ecosystem of tools and apps. And I think it might have been Guido Van Rossom that said that uh, in a recent interview with uh, Lex Friedman, that uh, the majority of his code is now written actually with generative AI. And so my, my question is to what extent are large language models and prompt engineering and generative AI, to what extent are they going to replace conventional tools and platforms for engineers such as coding over the next five years, over the next 10 years, and maybe over the next 20 years? Thank you. Yeah, so you know, I think that uh, um, so early, it turns out that programmers are among the, you know, one of the developers was one of the core groups of early adopters of these types of generative AI tools, which is why many generative AI tools today, they're actually pretty good for coding. And I think, um, uh, actually, GPT-4, I, I, I find, works better for coding than, than 3.5, and Bard also has been doing nice things on coding. Um, there's something very interesting going on in how software is written. And I don't mean just GitHub Copilot, which is fantastic too, but I think GitHub Copilot has been very good at generating coding templates. But when I look at how some of my friends that work in some of the Gen AI companies code, you know, even the way, I, you know, the way I write code these days is very different than the way we used to do it one or two years ago. Um, uh, and I think that, uh, and I don't mean GitHub Copilot, I mean, you know, I don't know, a few weeks ago, actually Joe and I were hacking on something for translation, right, using using OMs. And uh, I needed to use an NLP library that I was not familiar with. And rather than, you know, look at the documentation, I prompted both Bond and GPT-4 to write code for me. And the code didn't work, but it just generated a template that I could then fix up and just got the job done much faster than, than um, then look at the documentation myself. So there's something very interesting happening on the workflow of developers uh, in how you know people are using LLMs to hope write code and then fix it. And sometimes you prompt the LLM um, uh, uh, to hope fix the bugs in his own code. Uh, but this workflow um, is actually not been documented systematically anywhere yet that I'm aware of. But I see my friends doing this and I'm doing this myself. Uh, and we're, we're working with some partners to hopefully teach this more systematically um, uh, at some point that will announce very soon. Uh, but I think, I, I think there's actually a one extreme change. Um, I don't think, in terms of job displacement, I don't think programmers jobs are going to go away anytime soon. I know when GPT-4V was demo with, you know, take a picture of a hand-drawn front-end. I know some front-end developers think, wow, will my job go away? But I think programming jobs will not go away for a long time. Uh, even if some of the tasks we do as programmers can be augmented or automated. Um, I think that, so actually, there's actually one, one, one other thing we've been doing, which is um, uh, when we work with large companies, we'll often go and look at the jobs people are doing and break the jobs down into tasks and look at what AI can automate by analyzing tasks rather than jobs. So it turns out when people think about, AI, and, uh, uh, if you think about um, AI automation, if you say, what can AI do for programmers? People may think, oh, programmers write code, let's automate the writing of code, right? People, people just think that way. But it turns out that if you look at the tasks that a programmer does, programmers do a lot of things. We write code, we debug code, we write documentation, we communicate with other stakeholders, line of requirements, um, you know, this long list of tasks. There's a US government funded website called ONET that lists, I think, 17 tasks that programmers do, and some are easier to augment or automate than others. And so we've actually done this analysis with you know, many companies when, when we go in and analyze what are the tasks that people actually do, the tasks that are most valuable to augment or automate is, is actually, frankly, usually not the most obvious one. Um, and because we do so many tasks, I, I think it's very happy if Gen of AI can augment or automate a few of these tasks, but I think it's very hard for AI to automate everything we do, which is why I, I'm confident programming jobs are not going away anytime soon. Um, uh, but, but, but I think maybe AI, programmers that use AI may replace programmers that don't use AI. Uh, and, and I think this will be true for a lot of different professions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm also a business owner, so I'm asking about a business problem. Uh, I run a travel company for 10 years, so I'm pretty excited for your first part of your speech because you say we will become a data-centric AI. But I'm pretty worried at the end of your speech because you say only cooperate with the new company. 
So what will you give the suggestion for the established company? Maybe about five to ten years. We are not young enough, but we already have data. I see. No, you know, I think I think that what no, I think there there are opportunities for everyone. I think there are opportunities for um, the huge companies. Uh, we sometimes work with very large companies. You know, like the uh, uh, kind of the you know hundreds of billions of dollars, or uh, or sometimes even more kind of market cap types of companies. Um, and then I think there are opportunities for there are opportunities for you know the high school student that just ran a biology experiment and they have data. Uh, so I think everywhere from high school student all the way up to the you know hundred plus billions of dollars or the trillion dollar market cap companies, there are lots of opportunities to, to adopt and embrace AI. Um, and maybe actually in terms of uh, uh, you know travel agency, um, the two most common applications I'm seeing built with generative AI, like so many companies are building this. One is um, specialized verticalized chatbot. So the companies are experimenting with uh, chatbots for like travel advice or customer service agents. Uh, the, the other most commonly built Gen AI application, maybe less relevant to travel, I'm not sure, is AI to answer questions against a set of documents. These are, when I hear what companies are doing, these are really by far the two most common things. A specialized chatbot and a QA bot to answer questions using the company's you know, proprietary documents. But I think there are lots of opportunities for companies of all sizes to, to, to do these things. Yeah, due to time limitation, probably we take the last question. So anyone could raise? Okay, you are the first. You are the fastest one. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm a medical doctor. So I have some question and want to ask you about the vision or some suggestion or uh, anything about the medical AI in the gen generative learning. Yeah. Um Let's see, so I'm finding very interesting work on um, using Gen AI to interpret electronic health records. Um, uh, so uh, actually, maybe one, one example, one, one, one small project that uh, a student and I did at Stanford was using a small LLM, uh, fine tune, and we, we ran this at Stanford because of um, electronic health records. Uh, uh, we could not ship the data because you know, it was EHR, confidential data, we could not ship it to a cloud provider. But using LLM to uh, fine tune at Stanford servers uh, in order to read electronic health records. Um, but I find that there are a lot of opportunities like that as well. Oh, Landing AI, our computer vision tool, is actually used for a lot of medical use cases. Uh, 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 yeah, medical, a, lot of, a lot of medical imaging use cases. We, we, we see people doing this. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for um, AI to be applied to healthcare and medicine. Um, and maybe I want to share one, one last thought right, before we wrap, which is I feel like you know, Taiwan has a lot of unique industries where it is very strong. Uh, semiconductor manufacturing is the obvious one, also industrial manufacturing, you know, strong seaport at Kaohsiung, right, strong international commerce, a um, lot of big agriculture industry, but there are a lot of industries where Taiwan is very strong. And this means that um, there are also a lot of projects that are going to be more efficient to build here in Taiwan than, say, I could ever build in the Silicon Valley. I mean, just to take one example, you know, precision machinery, right? A lot of that, hundreds of companies in Taiwan built precision manufacturing machinery. Um, whereas in contrast, if I wanted to work on that in the Silicon Valley, I have no idea who I would collaborate with. So I think that there are all these sectors where Taiwan is very strong, um, and we're starting to try to talk to local partners to try to analyze the tasks and opportunities for AI uh, uh, opportunities uh, for different for different you know, companies. And, but I think for all of you too, um, uh, in the industry sectors where Taiwan is uniquely advantaged, I'm confident there'll be a lot of opportunities for really everyone here to pursue AI opportunities using supervised learning or gen AI or other technologies. Um, but I think with the uh, in, in addition to the fact that the whole world looks here, you know, the hope with the, with the silicon and the, and the semiconductor hardware. So I think a lot of opportunities for AI. Um, and I was excited also to hear about all the exciting education and research work going on in NTU. Um, so, so well, let me just say, you know, thank you very much. I hope we have more opportunities to collaborate and that I'll find ways to hopefully support the exciting work ahead to be done in Taiwan and AI. So thank you very much.